Welcome back to this special edition of 12 Days in March. I think you can tell by the title what makes this a special edition. That's right, we'll be shifting our focus to step two, but not in the way you expect. As I begin the deep dive into step two, we're going to pay a lot of attention to the connection between steps one and two, highlighting how the general principles for understanding diseases and disease categories are virtually identical. An inflamed joint on step two requires the same diagnostic approach as in step one. Hot joints don't suddenly change on step two, although the derivatives move in a different direction. But you can't get the derivatives without first making the diagnosis. Another major principle from step one that applies equally as well to step two are the guidance in interpreting NBME vignettes. It is the same process. To make a correct diagnosis, you will be applying those same typical associations I emphasized in the video series on interpreting NBME vignettes. So all the lessons you learned on step one and all the practice questions you did were not in vain. In this short video, I want to highlight these principles and let you know the future direction of 12 days in March. For this exercise, I've pulled some sample questions from the USMLE site to underscore these principles. So here's our first question, and I'll start by eyeballing the physical exam. Remember, I'm not always fond of their deceiving verbiage. So they start with normal vital signs, that is, no fever, and that tends to be important information. They go on to describe a large effusion of the knee, which is red and hot, and thereby sounds inflamed. So we have an inflamed knee in an afebrile patient, suggesting this is probably not a septic joint. Next, we'll take a peek at the data. And the numbers are unrevealing, other than an elevated white blood cell count of 13,000. But look at this x-ray, calcification of the synovium. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I've heard of calcification of the cartilage, as in chondrocalcinosis, but calcification of the synovium is not a mainstream term that we kick around in the clinic. So with that background, let's take a look at the options and ponder our typical associations. And for the sake of expediency, it is fair to say that DVT does not present with a hot joint and joint calcifications. Gonorrhea is a common player in the septic joint presentation, but there is no fever, and I've never heard a lecture on gonococcus where they emphasize joint calcification. We know a lot about gout, including the derivative of uric acid stones. Recall the hallmark of uric acid stones is radiolucency, not opaqueness. So gout, common as it is for an acute hot joint, should not be associated with joint calcification. Hemarthrosis associated with bleeding disorders can cause some dystrophic calcification, so it will remain on our differential list a bit longer, along with pseudogout but we can eliminate the septic joint for the same reason we eliminated gonorrhea. So here we've narrowed it down to two choices. Now let's see if the question verbiage offers us some assistance. So we see a 57-year-old with two hours of pain on a bunch of meds, including dual antiplatelet drug therapy and heparin. And although these can be associated with bleeding, hemarthrosis would be rare, and truth told, if calcification was to complicate bleeding, it surely wouldn't be acute. And let's be real. On the boards, the only time we really discuss spontaneous hemarthrosis is with hemophilia, and that was not offered in this vignette. So the most likely diagnosis is pseudogout or chondrocalcinosis. It fits best with an acutely inflamed joint in an afebrile patient with calcification on an imaging study. Insofar as synovial calcification, I will remind you that perfection is the enemy of good. Step two picks up where step one leaves off with purposefully deceiving language. But if you ponder the typical associations for each answer option, as you did in step one, you'll have greater success in negotiating your way around NBME vignettes. Let's try one more question to highlight our principles from step one. This is a sequential question with two parts. So here again, we have a painful joint also for two days. No trauma or pre-existing joint issues, which essentially excludes rheumatoid arthritis. The patient is sexually active, and they love sexually active patients with acute joint problems. She is afebrile, and they want us to identify the next step in her diagnostic workup. Surprise! What do we have here? The first step for the acutely inflamed joint on step two is exactly as it was on step one, the synovial fluid analysis. Nothing has changed. Lo and behold, look at the answer choices. Arthrocentesis sits front and center. And that brings us to part two of the question where they offer the results of the synovial fluid analysis. They want you to be able to interpret synovial fluid studies. 
So she has 120,000 leukocytes, which is impressive, but of equal diagnostic importance is the differential of those cells, 90% neutrophils. That's a big number. And with that, I think we can identify a pyogenic infection described as septic arthritis as accounting for this acutely inflamed joint. And without getting too deep in the weeds, the principal bugs causing septic arthritis continue to be Staph aureus and Neisseria gonorrhea. On step two, the derivatives are apt to focus on antimicrobial therapy, but to choose the correct treatment, you had to follow the same diagnostic strategy you learned on step one. And with that introduction, carrying forward key principles we learned in preparing for step one, we are off to the races on step two. Much more to follow in the months ahead. I wish you best of luck with your continued studies and ongoing patience and resiliency through this godforsaken pandemic. Feel free to email me if you have any questions or concerns. I do miss you guys.